All right. Hello. Good morning. Thanks to Bloomberg for having all of us and organizing the logistics of this, which are fantastic. I'm Ann Bowser. I'm the Director of Innovation at the Wilson Center. We're a quasi-government think tank in Washington, D.C. And I am presenting on citizen science and data integration for understanding marine litter, along with Jillian Campbell, the Chief Statistician of UN Environment, Dilek Frazel, who is getting her PhD on exactly this area, and Matisse, who is with me at the Wilson Center. So I always like to start with some horrifying statistics. <laughs> The problem, there are 5 to 13 million tons of plastic entering the ocean each year from land-based sources. And this is a problem because it's a lot of litter, but also that's quite the range, the 5 to 13 million, and it would be helpful to the world if we could narrow that down. Uh, the goal, SDG 1411, I'm not a statistician, so I was looking this up on my cell phone. By 2025, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, including marine debris and nutrient pollution. And the method for measuring this looks at four different types of data collection, beach litter, floating plastics debris, uh, pollution in the seafloor and seabed, and then also plastics that's been ingested in various biota, such as seabirds. And addressing the problem requires a holistic approach, including both data and action, which is where we think that citizen science can come in. Citizen science is just generally public participation in scientific research to meet real world goals. A couple things to highlight from this slide, people participate in citizen science for a range of reasons. In the case of 1411, it's because they care about plastics or they're probably already involved in a community doing something like a beach cleanup. They produce quality data because in the process of participating, they actually learn and they become more skilled over time in a particular topic, but also learning about the scientific research process and developing those sorts of skills that are transferable to other contexts. This knowledge supports action and accountability when it's designed correctly. And then it also prevent, uh, sorry, presents the opportunity to aggregate local data for use in global, regional, and national decision making, which is why UN Environment is invested in this work. Couple examples specific to 1411. The Australian Marine Debris Initiative is sort of one of the gold standards that we look at. You have volunteers participating in beach and river cleanup, so they're collecting plastic debris on beaches and then they're sorting them and entering what they are looking at into uh, a mobile application, which then feeds into a database developed in partnership with the Australian government, and that partnership is key for actually getting this information in SDG reporting. This enables modeling, tracking to the source, and then actually informs source reduction plans. We're trying to duplicate the Australian example elsewhere and are looking at pilots in Kenya and France. Second example, dive against debris. It's similar, except it's looking at scuba divers and encouraging them to monitor plastic litter on the seafloor. So I mentioned four classic protocols. This is one and two. And I wanted to highlight these two projects as contrasting examples of how different local communities are interested in different things, beach cleanups or diving. But through this process, they are meeting that local need in their particular interested way, but then also contributing to global monitoring. How are we going to scale this? There's a really good opportunity coming up. April 22nd, 2020 is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And the Wilson Center, along with the US Department of State, Earth Day Network, and other partners, including UN Environment, are launching Earth Challenge 2020 as the world's largest coordinated citizen science project to date. And our goal is to engage millions of people in collecting and integrating over 1 billion open and interoperable citizen science data points. So two goals of this project help coordinate what's already out there, including data, but also providing citizen science communities the tools that they might not have to do their work better. And then also to build capacity for new citizen science with the twin values of advancing knowledge and driving action. This is the methodology. It's, it's a tech development project, really. Uh, we're working with groups like the Open Geospatial Consortium to build new data and metadata standards. 
I think what's really important from my perspective here is that controlled vocabulary for documenting things like data quality practices so that data users can understand fitness for purpose or fitness for reuse and different types of research and policy. Also a data catalog, this is actually my pet project, that's going to allow people to peer review data sets, which I think is pretty cool. A uh, platform for data access through a range of REST APIs, and then also different tools for data analytics and visualization. Amazon and Esri are great partners in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, mobile application with data collection widgets. We have six research questions that we're looking at for Earth Challenge 2020. One of them is what is the extent of plastics pollution, so there will be two widgets for data collection in that area. These will also link to partner projects. And then this is Earth Day Network uh, in the lower right-hand quadrant. They're developing classroom resources and also what you can do toolkit so that after you submit data through the app on Earth Day, you actually get a prompt back telling you individual behavior changes that you can take and then also identifying policy interventions like a straw ban, for example, or a plastic spag ban that are relevant to where you are in the world when you're sharing your data. And then there's a couple other cool stuff, like a data cube with the European Space Agency for harmonizing citizen science and Earth observations. Where are we so far? Anyone from Datakind here? I think there are a couple speakers. Yay! <laughs> we did a hackathon with uh, Datakind DC in, I think it was March, and they looked at three existing citizen science projects, NOAA's Marine Debris Monitoring and Assessment Program, uh, one from the European Environment Agency called Marine Litter Watch, and then also an NGO-run project called TIDES. And this is what we came up with initially. This is a map of where citizen science activities are. This isn't necessarily a heat map of plastics data, although we do hope to get there. But this is already interesting, because if you're Earth Day Network and you're in charge of outreach for this project, you can understand, you know, it seems like there are some places that you would want to target where we don't already have data coming in if you're a funder, especially like a local foundation trying to understand how you can maximize your impact around plastics pollution. This type of information resource is going to be valuable to you as well. And then you can also just see some really interesting things. You know, obviously the global nonprofit one has the most global data set, but the Europeans are doing a better job than we are at NOAA. Sorry if anyone here is from NOAA about <laughs> getting their technology and their project used outside of their primary uh, geographic jurisdiction. This is an example of what we're working towards, a global heat map of plastics distribution as measured through citizen science and then cross-validated with other information like Earth observations. Um, and I deliberately talked fast, so I have one moment for questions. Hi, uh, what sort of information are you, um, you, you, I think you mentioned something about annotating the trash uh, that you're pulling out of the ocean. What's being, is it like a picture or? That's a great question. Um, so we're actually, this whole project is crowdsourced. And one of the things that we did is we launched a global call for researchers to come together and help design the protocols for data collection and data validation. We have a hundred and 63 people from 38 countries who've signed up to join us so far, which is really exciting. And for this particular research question, plastics, it's actually one of the more complicated ones. And we have an easy version of the mobile app and a hard version of the mobile app. The easy version, the use case is it's just a, it's a photo. So you're walking down the street and you take a picture of a piece of plastic and it goes into a database or a bunch of plastic altogether. We have a couple use cases for this. We're working with municipalities to be able to design better uh, waste resources. Also, university campuses will use this to do something simple, like put a recycling bin here. We're also working with a partner crowdsourcing platform that will be able to label those images, which is a source of validation, but then also providing additional data. The hard version of the app is a really long, structured survey like what the Australians are doing that asks people to report on all types of beach litter that they're picking up with a lot of granular information on plastics, including things like, this is a bag and this is a straw. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Alan from Two Sigma's Data Clinic. And I'm Jonathan Cruz, the Manager of Financial Planning at Molten Miguel Water District. Uh, so we'll be talking today about a project that I guess we've been collaborating on, on 
automated water usage detec uh, anomaly detection. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right past the disclaimer. Uh, so, Mont Miguel Water District, uh, we are a data forward utility in Southern California, and we provide water recycled water and wastewater service to approximately 172,000 residents in our area. Um, Really where this project came from has a lot to do with the fact that at Molten Nagel, we love data. We've seen the benefits of it, and um, in particular, the partnerships that we get out of it from, from uh, meetings like this one. So uh, with that, we do, we host datathons. We are probably one of the only agencies that actually has data scientists on staff. And the reason for that is because we know that data will ultimately save our ratepayers money. Uh, and so one of the big initiatives that we were really pushing for is moving towards something that was called AMI, or Advanced Metering Infrastructure. And that's going away from what was the classic model of, what was the classic model of uh, manual meter reads in which you would go and have someone physically go out to a meter and see what it said. Some of our customers were only on what's called bi-monthly billing, which means that they would actually have to go and go two whole months without seeing a point of data. So they would have six points of data a year. AMI gives us hourly data, which means they now have 24 points of data in a day. So in one day, you have four years. In two days, you have eight years, and so on down the list. And so with that, um, we knew that this was really an opportunity, because with this huge amount of data, we're able to use high-powered statistics that we would not have been otherwise. So with this opportunity, we um, were able to uh, start working with the Group 2 Sigma, in which uh, we're able to go and try and target um, meters that are malfunctioning in the, uh, and reduce non-revenue water loss. And what that means is that uh, if a meter starts to underreport, it's going to say that someone is using less water than they actually are. For our agency in particular, that's you know as much as a multi-million dollar um, issue, and that has, is a cost that has to be borne by ratepayers ultimately. Uh, there was a study from the World Health Organization that I believe said it costs about fourteen billion dollars a year annually to deal with this issue. So with that, we turned to data to find clever solutions. So I'll turn it over to. Clever data scientist. Uh, yeah, so multi all came to um, us at uh, Data Clinic. Uh, we're an internal arm of Two Sigma uh, that tries to volunteer some of our hopefully data science expertise um, to try to work with our partners. And in particular, um, the goal for this work was twofold. Um, so first, as Jonathan had mentioned, um, there's a lot of potential problems that could occur with water meters. It's the case that they could there could be a leak somewhere, there could be misreporting, and as a result, one of the goals of our model was first to identify when this was happening. So in order to identify, basically trying to identify anomalies or unusual behavior that we might be seeing in the sites. Um, but in addition to this, um, a second goal would be to actually prioritize the sites that we see um, that are with, or that we flag based on how much water we expect the site to be losing. And as a result, this allows for a human inspector to proactively inspect the issues starting from the most impactful ones. Um, so that's the two goals. But before we actually began working on a model for this, I guess one question that might come up is whether or not a model is actually helpful here. Um, so we believe that this is the case, um, first of all, because there are too many sites for a human inspector to visit, uh, but also because we wouldn't expect a global, rule to, a global rule to work particularly well here, because a lot of sites have somewhat erratic water usage. In particular, a residential site might act very differently from a commercial one, and even two residential sites might have very different usage because people just tend to use water differently. Another question that we want to ask before starting on a model is what we're actually looking for. Typically, for some projects, um, people might look for outliers. But in our problem setting, um, outliers actually might not be the most important thing to look for. In particular, they might even be false positives. If we look at uh, this site on the left here, um, we can see that a little bit before November 2017, uh, there are a few days where water usage looks like it drops to zero. Um, and you might initially say, oh, this is an anomaly. This is unusual behavior. But um, from another perspective, if the owner of this meter um, decided to go on vacation for a few days, it could just be the case that water usage drops to zero because there's nobody using water. And we might not want to even flag this at all. Um, to formalize this kind of intuition a little bit, um, what we're actually looking for is for the water usage before the outlier here or the anomaly um, in the teal, and looking at the water usage after the anomaly in red, and actually plotting the expected water distribution that we see uh, we see that for an outlier here, the probability of density is, uh, uh, the distribution is similar for the two time, time frames. Uh, we contrast this with an actual change point, which we, what would be similar to what we're actually looking for. And so here, if we look at the teal uh, line before the change point and the red line after the change point, uh, we can see that the distribution of water usage actually differs greatly. 
And so what we're actually trying to do is identify days when this is the case here on the bottom, when the distribution of water is different. So our model actually does this in four steps. Um, first, looking at historical data, we try to predict the actual distribution of water usage um, that we would expect for today. Then, after we observe the actual water usage we saw today, using our observed value and the distribution we predicted, we're able to compute a likelihood for how likely we expect that this point came from this said distribution. With these likelihoods, we then score and aggregate them together in order to produce a more smooth score. And then we run a simple autoregressive model on these scores themselves to actually detect whether or not a change point has occurred. So a little bit more concretely, um, if we're actually looking at, on the top here in blue, the uh, time series of the normalized water consumption for a given site, and on the bottom here, um, the scores that our model might produce, uh, we might say want to threshold our scores at two, which would give us two time periods that are flagged here that each correspond to the yellow boxes um, where water behavior, the usage behavior does, tend to, does look like it's different. And in particular, looking at the green boxes before, um, while the score may jump up for a few days, because we're aggregating and smoothing our scores, so <coughs> we're trying to aggregate and smooth our scores, we instead see that the scores increase for a few days, but don't actually jump up above two. Now, we initially saw some promising results, um, but as with any project, um, when you're starting to see this and you're thinking, oh, uh, we can now begin to tune this, uh, you want to avoid the situation that we see in this famous comic here. And one question with this project is what ground truth actually is. Um, our model may say, oh, we predict that there is an anomaly in this site on this given day, but we don't really have any data that corresponds to this. We have no idea whether or not the meter was actually, was actually malfunctioning on that day. And instead, the data that we have with data from Molten Iguel would be uh, work order data that they had. So this would be customers actually calling in to say, hey, there's a potential problem in my meter. Can someone come take a look at it? And using these work orders um, to start to validate our model, uh, we saw that we were able to capture 67% of work orders. And in particular, because the feedback loop for work orders is rather slow, a customer has to get their bill, see it, notice that there might be an issue, and then call in. Uh, we were able to detect a lot of these unusual behavior long before the work order actually began. And as a result, this would help us save water in the meantime. But where work orders are imperfect is actually in the other side, where if we look at the sites that we have high change point scores for, 34% of them did not have an associated work order. But we're not actually sure what this means. Um, in particular, it could just be the case that nobody noticed that there was a problem, or that the problem is so small that a customer wouldn't have noticed it on their bill. And this is where the importance of working together uh, and collaborating comes in. Um, and so we are working together with Molten Iguel to try to collaborate on this and actually run the model in the field and actually try to validate um, based on sending out technicians to see if there were, really, were there were problems with the sites. And of course, this lets us have, with actual ground truth data, this lets us better fine tune and tweak the model as always. So yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is George Wachadze, City University of New York. And my question is, I'm a little bit, you know, um, I don't want to use the word confused, but uh, this entire exercise seems to me that you are basically testing how good quality your water meters are. Because I, I don't understand why you are, you know, uh, uh, they're digging whether uh, water meter represents, you know, qu high quality data or not. If, uh, you know, if one water meter makes mistake, that's not a big deal. So for me, big deal is to incentivize customers. If they use uh, high, you know, uh, lots of water, they get a high price to pay. That's the most important. And another solution which instantly comes in my mind, why don't you put two water meters and if their, you know, uh, uh, you know, rank, uh, their measurements differ, instantly that's the signal. You don't need data for this col to collect and to analyze. Thank you. So I'm glad you asked specifically as to the why we bother to do any of this. Um, <laughs> though I do have an academic background, this isn't just an academic exercise. 
Um, this is a very real cost that we have to pay that would be attributable to, let's say, a given meter at someone who's using a lot of water, but their meter over time will eventually start to what we call under-register. And so that cost is now borne by all of the customers. And so just like you said, for the, the one meter that if I see that my bill is high, well, if my meter's not working, my bill's not high, I'm not going to ever receive the, the price signal to change my behavior. So there's that, and there's also the fact that water is a scarce and precious resource. So that if that water is being used or if there's a leak or something, we don't know that it's going on. That you know, the more that we can do to, to either not necessarily proactively, but early on go and get this one particular malfunctioning meter out and a good one put in, um, then we can reduce this cost that everybody has to bear and, and save what really is a precious resource. So again, with the, the data point of it, and I'll, I'll add one point to, to Alan's was that if this, actually, this method actually captured 100% of the work orders that we generated. There was just another subset of uh, flags that were created that we don't even have work orders for yet. Um, and because of the fact that this method in some instances led as many as I think it was eight months from our existing process, that there was almost an entire year of water use that um, wasn't being captured accurately. And so if we're trying to find out system losses, things of that nature, this is really how we go about doing it and identifying what's just a meter versus what's a broken pipeline. Hi there. Um, so is the, the change point analysis, that's a mean difference in change point analysis, right? So it's like, I guess you're looking specifically for the water meters which are systematically over-representing or under-representing. Is there, I mean, is there a case for like the change point in terms of variance? Like if meters, is that a mechanical possibility that meters just, they don't systematically over or underrepresent, they just lose precision over time? And is that something that you might be looking into? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, that's something we're starting to take a look into. Um, so right now our change point model do doesn't handle a lot of uh, large or small variance changes very well. Um, but we're working into, I guess, we're looking into, I guess, better predicting in that first step, predicting usage in such a way that we actually feed in a different input into our model that actually kind of normalizes for that problem. And I think we're out of time. But thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Michael Dowd. I'm from I'm a data scientist at DataKind, and today we're going to talk about a paper and project we did, uh, optimizing waste management collection routes, a collaboration between soil and DataKind. Um, we've already had a DataKind call out. Thank you. But just in case you don't know who we are. Uh, we're DataKind. We are a nonprofit whose mission is harnessing the power of data science and AI in the service of humanity. Uh, we do this through projects, thought leadership, events, and a, a lot of other things. Um, and we're excited to do this work and excited to share some of the things we've done. Uh, DataKind by the numbers. We've got a lot. Of, we've got a big community. We want you to be part of it. Make sure to get involved if you aren't yet. Uh, we've done a lot of projects, worked with a lot of orgs, and successfully been able to deliver a lot of pro bono services through volunteers, which is exciting. Um, today we're going to talk about this project. And so I'm going to talk about the challenge, the approach, uh, the model output, and some next steps. So the challenge. To, to sort of ground why we did this project and why this organization works on this problem, uh, it's a we're going to talk a little bit about the sort of sanitation challenge globally. So. 36% of the population lacks access to a toilet. This can lead to pollution, environmental and health issues, and this is something that should and needs to be addressed. Um, this is a particular issue in Haiti where our partner, Soil, operates. So Soil is a nonprofit working in Haiti. Their goal is to increase access to cost-effective, dignified household sanitation services. So they do sort of two main things. One is that they actually have like a transportation and logistics setup where they bring sanitation services to you through a container-based toilet system. Uh, and the second thing is they come, they collect that waste, they take it to a different site and transform it into new, clean, high-quality soil. Because Haiti also has a soil degradation issue. The other things that are also going on here is this becomes soil that can be sold and this becomes like a beneficial cycle whereby they're able to expand their services, provide more clean soil, provide clean sanitation, things like that. Um, DataKind helped out on the transportation and logistics side. We didn't have as much insight on the uh, waste transformation side. So today we're talking a little bit about this container-based soil solution or this container-based toilet solution. Um, to get a sense of what that looks like, it pretty much looks like buckets. Um, they do have seats and other things for them, but this is the way it's set up sort of in the field. So how does this actually work? So they have customers in blue here. They're spread out. This, we're looking at Cap Haitian here. 
So they're spread out in a number of different neighborhoods. Um, we're looking at about 1,000 households with a variety and mix of sort of demand or a number of um, toilets at the location. They also have some facilities. They have things like depots and then um, some like waste transfer waste stations where it's basically just a truck that, that they park. Uh, and then we have vehicles and collectors. They use wheelbarrows, three-wheelers, and then they have the collectors or the workers. And then again, finally, this is one of the wheelbarrows with the buckets. So the two challenges that Datakind tried to help them out with were transportation costs and logistics. And that's the thing for soil, is actually their biggest cost is transportation. And what they want to be able to do is expand their services to whoever needs them so that everybody who wants can have access to something like this. Um, but transportation is expensive, so they asked, you know, is there a way that we could make this work more efficiently? Um, the other issue is that there's a lack of easy-to-use optimization tools, or, I mean, real, realistically, also affordable ones. Um, many of these cost many, many thousands of dollars for a yearly license. They're also, you know, hard to use, complicated. And so our challenge through our volunteer team and myself was to try to build them a system that they could use for their specific problem that could help solve some of these issues. So essentially it's saying, where, like, what is the most efficient route to visit all of the customers they need to visit, collect the waste, and then you know, take it back to the depot. So how did we do this? And you're gonna get this messy thing that we sometimes refer to as do data science. Um, so it's just a lot of stuff. Um, the thing I'll shout out here is anything in orange is sort of software and code written by our team. Um, and so basically it does three things. It does data preparation. We actually do a modeling or optimization step. Uh, and then we do visualization, which you could think of as um, sort of like output that they can use. So in terms of the approach, we have customer data, which I mentioned. Um, we have like the number of buckets that they're likely to have, or we have an estimated like what we assume is the number of buckets. We have vehicle data as well as the capacity of the different vehicles, as well as some speeds and things like that. A lot of that's a little rough, but you know we, we tried where we could. And then we have facility data. Um, the last thing I'll call out, though, is the OSM road network. So OSM is wonderful, amazing, OpenStreetMap. Um, it was identified as the highest quality representation of reality in Haiti. Um, and so we used that in this project. We also used OSRM, sorry, which is a routing machine, which is also great and free. Um, the thing I'll call out about OSM is that during the project, we identified with our partner issues in the data, and they were able to just go and fix them, which is really great for something like this. And even our team had to like sometimes edit the data live because the bridge isn't there, but the bridge is there. Or the bridge isn't there anymore, you know, that sort of thing. Um, all right, so we'll hop to it. Uh, next step after we prepare the data, we feed it into a model. So we use the Google OR tools um, package. It's awesome. It's really complicated, it's super confusing. Um, I'm great, we had a bunch of experts that were able to help us out you know, to write this for soil. Um, what we used was a capacitated vehicle routing problem, um, and let's try to, to parse that real quick. So we have vehicles that have different capacities, right? You've got trucks, wheelbarrows, three-wheelers. You have a depot where you're gonna leave and come from, and what's nice about the soil problem, at least from a data point, is that basically they're giving they're delivering and taking in the same amount. So it's like if FedEx came to your house and gave you one package and then you know, took another one, always. So that makes the, the problem a little easier. Uh, Blue Dots are customers. This is their demand in bold. And then there's costs to travel. So the idea is how can they most efficiently visit all customers while minimizing time or cost, but making sure also that the vehicles are able to accommodate um, the capacity. So we were able to do this. We built this, custom Python bindings, get excited. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, finally, what comes out of it is something that is, you know, actually able to be used by um, the client or the partner here. So these were actual HTML maps with a suggested route, a sequencing of customers, also some text solutions. We tried to do turn by turn instructions, but Realistically, does that make sense when you know roads get washed out and things change sometimes? Um, it's also just like a hard thing as a human to parse like this, you know. Um, so I'll show you a little bit more detail here. Ooh, that resolution. Okay, um, this is a sort of high-level admin map. So what we're seeing here is all of their different zones. Colors indicate zones. Dots indicate customers. And then if you were, say, like an administrator at Soil, you could see all of the different trips that need to be made 
to visit all of your customers. So this might be a week's worth of trips. Um, of more interest is, is likely this. So this is a single zone and the four trips that are needed to visit all of the customers. So they would do this once or twice a week. Um, if I was a collector, I might be assigned route zero and route one, and then I could see the path I you know, likely might want to take, although we recognize reality is often different than what we have in our data, um, but also the sequencing of customers that sort of makes the most sense. Um, and this is handed off to the collector via a mobile device. So they load this on. It's a static HTML file. They can look at it uh, and sort of see the sequencing. All right. So Soil is currently testing this. We've handed it off, implemented it in the cloud for them. Um, they're also testing the routes to see if you know things make sense. I would say you know, room for improvement. There's always more advanced and more interesting optimization models out there. There's a lot of sort of flexibility that could be added. Um, we're also exploring releasing a generalized open source solution, so clearing out any proprietary data, proprietary data, and sort of using toy data, because we think we, we think and have heard other orgs are interested in things like this. Finally, a big thank you to our volunteers. I'm not going to say all their names right now, but they were great. If you check out the paper, their names are in there. Friend them on LinkedIn. Uh, also, a big thanks to the 11th Hour Project, which helped fund this work. And if we have time for questions, also there's the link, data kind, get involved. Thank you. Uh, do, do you know the demand on in front when you, you know, plan to, you know, collect this, uh, you know? So we, we, had, we had about half of the demand. So we knew from their Thank records you. about how many buckets people had. Um, and they actually just need to collect it. Um, and so it's, it's a fairly easy one. It's not going to, like, surprise you with the demand. They still have to request more buckets and things like that. So yeah. OK, I think we have time. Thank you, everybody. My name is Maria Perez Urdiales, and I am going to pre present today this work in progress that I have with my co-author, Samuel Etzen Torino. We are both uh, working at the economics department at Tony Brook University. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, water affordability and price progressivity in the US, in some US cities. So when we think about the six sustainable development goals, we know that it aims at ensuring availability of water and sanitation for all. So when we usually think about this problem, we tend to think about developing countries. But uh, because of income stagnation and increasing cost of water, we are also experiencing this problem in uh, other uh, developed economies, such as the US. So this is not a problem that is very easy to, to solve because there is somehow a tension between providing water at a lower price so that is affordable for everybody, but also uh, implementing higher water rates so that uh, we discourage a wasteful use of water. So in this context, uh, using price progressivity may help because we can uh, price a basic uh, level of water at a lower price, so at a low rate, and then we can increase uh, the price of water, the unit price of water, when consumption reaches certain th thresholds. So there are other papers in, in the literature uh, analyzing water affordability and also price progressivity, but it's amazing because nobody is really linking these two concepts. So we have some papers, especially in the water affordability context, that are analyzing this at a micro level, so using household level data. One of the problems about doing this is that you usually have proprietary data that are very expensive to collect, and they usually you do it just once. So you have a one snapshot, and then you don't really understand what is the evolution of this over time. And then there are other papers that are using aggregated data, so usually at municipality level. But the problem about this is that um, they tend to focus on a region, so they cannot give a, a description of the situation in the country. And also, they don't tend to look at variability within the municipality. So while they consider income level as a determinant of unaffordability, they don't really consider this. They don't use to. They don't usually consider um, income dispersion, so inequalities, as part of the problem. So in our approach, what we want to do is to analyze both water affordability and price progressivity together. So we do that by estimating a simultaneous equation model. And we do that using publicly available data on 30 major US cities. 
that is easily updated every year. So we have sources such as Circle of Blue, the US Census, the US Drought Monitor, or even Google Trend. And then our method also explicitly allows to consider and observable uh, factors that affect both uh, variables. So even if we don't have certain information, we are recognizing these unobservable uh, characteristics. Um, also, price progressivity is included as a determinant of unaffordability. We also include income levels as it's common in the literature, but we consider also um, income dispersion as determinant. And not only we do that, but we also interact these income measurements with price progressivity to allow for nonlinear effects because we can think that price progressivity may be more or less helpful depending on the uh, distribution of income within a city. So these are the, the 30 major US cities we are using and they are the 20 largest US cities and also 10 um, representative uh, cities in, in certain regions. Um, so we have two indicators. On the one hand, we have the water and affordability indicator that is constructed as the ratio of the number of census tracts within a city where water bills for basic water needs uh, represent more than 2% of the median household income uh, to the total number of census tracts in the city. So what we are measuring with this is the proportion of census tracts where water is not affordable. And then we have uh, the price progressivity index that is computed as the jump, let's say, in terms of average prices that we experience for certain levels of water consumption. And we compute that those two indexes for each of these cities for the period 2013-2017. So we have five years. And here I'm just going to show uh, very quickly the correlation between unaffordability and progressivity. And you can also see with these box plots um, the distribution of these variables, and we do it for each of the years that we consider in the analysis. Something that you can see is that the correlation between these two indicators is not evident, so it's not, we don't see any linearity here, so this is what is uh, help, helping us to include these other variables because we think that there are non linearities. But also when we think about um, an affordability, for instance, in this axis, we can see that um, the median value represented with this uh, black line doesn't really change that much. It, it increases a little bit over time, but it doesn't change that that much. But what we can see is that compared to the first year, 2013, the interquantile range is really increasing. So we can see that over time in the US, there are more cities that have a higher proportion of census tracts experiencing water and affordability. When it comes to the, the other variable, price progressivity, we see that the median value of price progressivity is negative, it's less than zero. So we can see that, say that the median water rate in, the US, in these US cities is regressive. So uh, that's, uh, I think, a very relevant uh, point too. And we also see that um, it goes uh, a little bit uh, down over time, but then the last year it looks like the median price progressivity is around zero. So we are getting a little bit better. It seems that people are reacting, uh, water agencies are changing their tariffs. And I'm just gonna briefly show some preliminary results that we have. I'm gonna focus mostly on the um, equation where we are analyzing water and affordability. And I'm going to focus on the three main variables of interest that we have here. Uh, regarding income, we see that there is a, a negative effect of income on water and affordability. So we can, I mean, this is what we were expecting. Cities with a higher income level tend to have less problems of, of water and affordability. With income dispersion, we have uh, the opposite uh, sign, so it, there is a positive effect of income dispersion of, on unaffordability. So more unequal cities also have more problems of unaffordability. Price progressivity also has suspected a negative effect of water unaffordability. When we implement uh, progressive tariffs, we have less problems of unaffordability. But when it's interacted with the income levels, we see that 
this uh, coefficient is positive, which implies that the effectiveness of price progressivity is not that important when you have a higher level of income in the city. And also very interesting is that when it's interacted with the income dispersion, the effect is negative. So what we have is that the higher the level of inequality in a city, the more important it is, the more effective to implement progressive water tariffs to reduce uh, inequality um, and affordability problems. So as I said, this is uh, still a work in progress, um, but uh, we expect to, to update the data. So what we want to do is to create, let's say, uh, two indices that uh, policymakers can use to understand what is the evolution of this over time in the US, and also that it's useful for them to understand what is the distribution of income in their city, and how they can uh, tackle this problem in case they are suffering. And that's all. Okay. Thank you for coming. I am Lorenzo, and today I'm here with Matteo. We're going to present our research work for our master's thesis, which we did at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And we worked as in the lab led by Professor Tanya Berger-Wolf. Our work, as you might guess for the title, revolves around creating uh, SMEs for animal populations based on images found on social media and also from other sources. There's a very important reason for this. We know from a WWF report that we're losing biodiversity at an unprecedented rate. In the past 40 years, we've lost more than 60% of the word biodiversity, which is a really high number. And that's a problem because the health of and the Biodiversity on our planet tells us how our planet is doing. And not having information about it is not really good. We know that only 4% of the wildlife is being tracked, which is a really low number. And for this reason, the IUCN wants to improve this number and bump the number of monitored species from 100,000 to 160,000. And that's a great goal. However, it should be noted that monitoring a species doesn't really mean a lot in and of itself. A monitor species, like whale sharks, for example, has an estimated population of 103,000 individuals. However, the standard error goes from 27,000 up to 180,000, which is huge. It doesn't really tell us anything. It's a cool way of saying we don't really know stuff. <laughs> but that's what we got, so. <laughs> However, there's a good reason for not having a lot of like super quality estimates. It's really expensive because the traditional method requires skilled professionals to be on the field, capture the animals, tag them, and then release them. It's really dangerous, takes time, takes money. Another solution is to do aerial sightings, so to fly over with a plane, which again is really expensive. So we, there is a good reason not to do this on a high scale. And there's also a good reason that Wildbook was created. Wildbook is a machine learning based tool framework that does uh, image and automate, uh, AI and, automate and image analysis. It is capable of analyzing pictures and finding the, in the individual animals in the pictures. Which, so the first step that Wildbook has is the detection step. It is able of analyzing pictures and finding the animals in those pictures and telling us what species they're part of. Then the next step is a little bit more complicated. It looks at the unique patterns on every animal and this allows us to identify the individual animal, for example, the fluke of a whale. And we know that this is a specific individual, and this information is fundamental to create a good model for estimating populations. So for example, if we have a picture of a gravy zebra, Wildbook is cap capable, capable of telling us that there's a zebra in the picture, and this is a gravy zebra, not any other uh, zebra but we don't know stuff about this zebra. So we can compare the unique pattern on the zebra against all the other unique patterns in their data set, and we can look for matches. If we found some matches, we are able to say that we saw this zebra in another place at another time, and this information is really important to create our models. Wildbook can also go beyond pictures. It can analyze videos. There's a um, YouTube scraper that analyze, analyzes YouTube videos, and it has helped increasing the number of encounters, as you can see on the plot, a lot of uh, encounters in recent years has been uh, due to the use of AI. So now that I've introduced how we get our 
the logical leader, let Mathieu go through the challenges, sorry, and how we solve the problems. Thank you, Renzo. Hi, everybody. So Wildbook allows us to extract the biological information from images. The next step is understanding how the social media bias can affect the estimate when you use social media as a data source. So in other words, we want to understand how zebras that are on our planet are connected to zebras that you find on social media. So first, not all of these animals are seen by humans. Then just of some of them are photographed and then shared on social media. And finally, just a few of them can be retrieved using search engines because maybe they are not properly tagged, especially if you're, using, if you're looking for a particular species of zebras and not zebras in general. So all of these constitute a bias that actually gives you an error in the estimate when you use social media to estimate the number of animals of a given species. So to solve this issue, we wanted to understand how people share images of animals. So we collected, uh, we deployed several surveys uh, on Amazon Mechanical Targ. On each survey, we have uh, several images of animals and we asked the uh, we ask people which images they would have loved to share on social media. So in this way, we have created a data set where we have images collection, and for each image, we have a label shared or not shared. Then we have trained a machine learning classifier to predict which images would have been shared. In particular, we extracted from each image biological features using Wildbook. That means the species and the number of animal, individual animal that you can have on an SD card of a photographer beauty features related to the quality of the image, like contrast, luminosity, and finally, some collection level features to compare images inside the same SD card, because it's our belief that people is gonna share just the best images that they have and not like probably all of them. So we want a way to compare images. So as you can see from this result, basically I just want to tell you that using, if you look at the green results, that's the, our best model is actually use the collection level features, meaning that the structure of the SD card for instance, like the order of images, the order in which the images are in the SD card are meaningful and actually they affect the shareability of an image. So based on this, we wanted to do also the inverse pro process. So we train a regression model to estimate the number of animals that have been photographed but not shared on social media because it's really likely that the user is not gonna share all the images that he has. So looking at this result, you can actually see that this problem is learnable. And that's basically want, what we want to achieve to estimate the number of animals of an entire species. To estimate the population size, first we download the images of the animal. In our case, we wanted to study gravy zebras. And then for each image, we download the image collection. Then we apply the regression model to estimate the number of animals that have been photographed and not just only shared. And finally, we use a method coming from traditional biology to estimate the size of the entire population. You can see in black the official estimate that we have for gravy zebras. As you can see, like the dotted points in the middle are non-data, uh, non like we don't have any information about the gravy zebras for those years. Then you can see Zoli Suber in gray, this one, it's actually what we consider our baseline, and, the, and it is the application of like uh, biological methods directly applied on raw data without uses, using any machine learning model to take into account the problem of the social media bias. And finally, if you look at the blue line, it's our best, uh, best model, it's our framework, and if you compare it with the gray line, which is our baseline, it actually performs better for all of the years for which we have any information available. So to conclude, we have proven that both what we call the direct problem and the inverse problem, that is from SD card to social media and then back, are learnable. And actually that social media, uh, the structure of the SD card and social media images collection are meaningful and are useful in this problem. And also we have proposed a method to estimate the number of animals of a given species using social media images. So thank you for our attention. That's really interesting, thank you. Um, so we have this problem with charismatic megafauna, which is things like zebras that everybody loves to take pictures with. Could you do this with something like pollinators, which is uh, both smaller, more challenging from a visual standpoint, and also less data? That's a great question. and. I think the focus of the project is on endangered, like bigger animals, because they're more likely to be found. I don't think we the the project has been uh, tried on smaller animals. That'd be really interesting. I think it it'd be harder to get the data because both for like from citizen scientists and from social media, it's much harder to get a lot of pictures of smaller animals. So that's that's definitely interesting to explore. But I don't think we have anything on like pollinators and 
So uh, ne the next step for us is to collect more data because we have seen that collecting more data actually improves the results of the machine learning model, the regression model, and it is good. And we want to also to test this model on like um, reticulated giraffe because like Wild Book has a partnership, like they, they have a, with um, an event that took place in Kenya where they tried to have a census, a uh, complete census for uh, gravy zebras and reticulated giraffe. So that's our next step. Um, how do you deal, oh, great presentation by the way, but how do you deal with the fact that there is no uh, unique identifiers on all the, the pictures that you see in Lehman terms? Uh, how do you know that the zebra that is taken in pictures from one user is not the same as another? when you count a uh, number of total? Uh, I mean, uh, actually, that's what uh, we use Wildbook for. So yeah, that's the main goal of Wildbook is to identify individual animals among different pictures. Uh, so that actually helps a lot also the machine learning model because maybe you can find out like that you have the same zebras in 20 different pictures and maybe these pictures are really similar. So you can count all these different individuals. Yeah, and that's true for different species that have like the same pattern. They, they, they show, exhibit some patterns like giraffes or zebras. Where did you get the training data for the inverse problem? Inverse and are you, for the uh, regular problem, are you only accessing publicly available uh, or public profile pictures? We are out of time, but to so be super quick, the social media images were coming from Flickr and other social media websites. Their training data, we have two events that were held in Kenya where a lot of volunteers took pictures and they shared them vol voluntarily with the organizers. So we have a huge set of SD cards that contains these animals. And thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, um, our speakers, for the great presentations.